I have great pleasure in introducing the panel that's going to debate this topic. So we have Dr. Emmanuel Said, who's Deputy Dean, Head of the Marketing Department at the Faculty of Economics, Management and Accountancy, Fairmount University. We have Mr. Jesmin Saliba, who's Executive Chairman at Corporate ID Group. Dr. Chris Bonnet, who's Vice President and Head of the Legal and Football Governance Department of the Water Football Association. Ms. Helga Lohl, who's the President of Core Platform, amongst other things. And Dr. Roberta Lepre, who's CSR Expert and Managing Consultant for Weave Consulting. Who would like to go first and talk about the ethical implications of CNSR? Manpower. How far are people really motivated to donate? 
donate not just money, because at the end of the day it's true. When we turn to corporate social responsibility, the first thing that's going to mind is the challenge of money. Yes, if we're going to do something, it's going, it's going to cost us something. If it's going to cost us something, someone has to foot the bill. Who's that? It's the customer. And, and that equation in itself doesn't show that we're really oriented towards the social responsibility, does it? Does it? And which brings me to, right, if the money can be captured, as I was talking to Dr. Lepresh, we'll talk about it later on, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we weren't aware that there were actually funds that could be actually captured in our profit and loss accounts in when, when we developed efforts for money to corporate social responsibility. Third is, is, is the willingness of our people, or the willingness of our human resources to actually donate time for, for corporate social responsibility activities. What time are we talking about? Usually, human, human resources are employed for around eight hours a day, 40 hour work week. That is quite standard during your post of work. We've got full timers, part timers, we've got people on, 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 on uh, flexible working arrangements. But then, if we're going on a corporate social responsibility day, if we're going to put an effort, whose time would it be? Would it be the employee's private time? Would it be the corporate time? These are challenges. I mean, a finding, of course, is, is, is the culture. And I think that is the, the largest challenge that we have to, we have to discuss, really. Uh, Malta is, is one of those countries where, where our culture, one of our dimensions of culture, is pretty much individualistic, pretty much like Germany, pretty much like Britain. Whereas if we go to Asian countries, if we go to the Far East, the cultures are pretty much collectivistic. We never hear about corporate social responsibility in Asian countries, why? Right? Because it's part of their culture anyway. They're very much collectively, they're very much collectively or, or oriented. And organizations have a duty towards society. But we, we always listen to Western media, Britain, United States, Germany, about corporate social responsibility activities, corporate social responsibility initiatives. And it's like, wow, that is something big. Why? Because it counters their real culture. It's very much individualistic. Now, the question I ask is, how far are we trying to move our culture from being so individualistically oriented towards collectivistically oriented? Remember that the Everest was quite a challenge to scale, and it was done. Thank you, Dr. Sally. I think it actually brings us back to the intervention made by the Honourable Minister Fern, who talked about the ethical value, and actually he used the, the value word, and uh, the, the ethical considerations that come into this. I think Helen um, Borj Bonici mentioned if you have to look around and see what he's doing and roll up your sleeves and do it, but obviously it's not as simple as that, is it? Because then the other question was, what's in it for the company that's doing it? And that's the ethical dimension to it. Helga, would you like to tell us a bit more about this? Let me just explain that, I mean, like the World Bank defines CSR as a commitment of business to be paid ethical and to contribute to the sustainable economic development by working with all relevant stakeholders to improve their lives in the way they could for business, for sustainable development and society. So here we have the word ethical. What does ethical mean for a company? I'm president of the core platform. I come from a business background. We are supported by all the business institutions. And for me, ethical again means what are the values of your company? I think before you even talk about CSR, you have to establish the values of your company. Now, I am passionate, like you heard from the American uh, girl, I'm passionate about CSR, but I'm passionate about CSR before CSR really came on the platform because I'm passionate about people. People have so much value and to give. So when I came to Malta to work in a foreign country with a foreign workforce in a foreign society, the major thing for, us, for me was to, think, to get to know the people. What is their culture? What drives them? What is society? I am working in the society. I'm gaining my workforce from the society, so I have to live in it. So that brought us as a company, at the time Playmobil, to together with my management team, create our vision. What company do we want to be? What's important for us? We want to love to come to work. We want to have fun. We want to enjoy it. How do we enjoy it? By feeling a 
empowered, by having possibilities, by being heard and being part of the company, not just the top but the bottom up. And we were as well in a segment of the industry, which of the toy industry, where we where our product is to a very vulnerable <coughs> part of the society, so quality was top. We will not do anything which is not top quality for these uh, youngsters. And we, so we established all that. So we established our vision of what the company has to be. From that, we got out our mission. Now, how do we do it? How is the way we behave to fulfill this vision? From that, then, it came, actually, at a very early stage, that employees came and that we said, we are producing toys, there is an orphanage, there is this breeze, there is this, can't we give? Now, as a businesswoman or as a business person, you have a responsibility to your owner, to your shareholder, to whoever they are. So you have to be profitable and to be profitable as well for employees to be able to sustain, to pay, to empower them, to encourage them. So I said to, the, to, to my employees, rightly, but let's do it properly. Let's see how um, out for what right you are by donating and whatever you do will match. And together we will manage it. And I'm telling you, they put me to shame. So we had a very good budget and they were uh, involved in um, managing this budget. And we said, all right, now, as a, a half of it is coming from the employees, let's give it back half of them to them. But always under the premises, we give it to children. They are our customers, our livelihood depends on them, give it back to them. So we donated 50% or 50 were giving back to employees who have children who needed support, medical, whatever, scholarships or whatever. The other 50 was given to an NGO engaged in children's support, be it inspired, be it material school or whatever. And it was chosen by the employees and communicated and whatever. But that is not CSR at all. The other aspect of CSR was our own people educating them, empowering them. I had a workforce at the very beginning which was like the store people based on physical thing. Now barcoding came in, digital came in. All of a sudden, this workforce could not adapt. But you don't just so we did, and we worked a three, four shift system, so there was no way of going to an evening school. So what we did was, we did the We Learn program, so we all empowered our employees to learn again. And they did, with adult training, of you have to do it a different way, and as well tells them, if you give uh, 50 hours of your working time, to learn something that will be taken when we promote and when we look for. So we encourage them to continuously learn, because otherwise there comes a time when they are out of a job. So even this culture of empowering your people to, to go ahead. The other thing was waste. Waste in every aspect. We had children's classes coming, seeing our toy production. The first thing they were asking, what do you do with your plastic? And we showed them that we do not waste. We reuse, we do it, though it's waste in energy, it's waste in water, it's waste in people. Uh, or where we said, do we, do we have to do it like that? Can we do it better? Can we not waste our people for something which can be done by a machine, which can be done by ID? So all of this thing is part of CSR. That you live it within your organization. And I think if you are not Totally confident internally, don't go externally, don't go corporate, because it has to be living. Your employees will be the best ambassadors if it's continuous <coughs> and it keeps the trust in, within the company, then go outside, because then you can literally uh, contain it, you can show it, and I think uh, this is what I want to try and tell business people, that it does pay business to do business in an ethical, good way in every aspect, from your loyalty, from your employees, but then also from your customer base. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing very practical
real down-to-work examples of how it's supposed to work and can work in practice. Now, Jasmine's here for the corporate ID group, but I really hope you're going to bring journalism into this, because so far it's been slightly absent in what we've been talking about. Well, um, the subject is close to what happened was I had a number of hats which I've gone through to do this discussion, and obviously uh, the ethical considerations come to the fore on a number of uh, aspects, in particular the way we can engage with the media, so that maybe we, I address also the question raised before. <coughs> Amongst various roles, I do have a role within an uh, institution in Water, which works in the, dis in the disability sector, and uh, which is the recipient of one of the major fundraising committees, which takes part in Malta. And let's start from the first ethical consideration there. We go miles in analyzing, discussing, brainstorming to decide which stories we should discuss and create awareness about to make sure that all ethical aspects related to the sector of disability are covered. We open the channels with the respective authorities, with the commissioner for the persons for the rights of persons with disability, to make sure that in this field the right messages are sent because of the sensitivity and because of that element of ethical consideration, which believe me, I am sure every fundraising event which happens goes under scrutiny primarily so that it ensures that besides the consent, given the strength of the telephone program I was referring to Sharma, given the strength and the widespread coverage it has, one also sends the right question. I allow me that there is a lot of thought and at times uh, discussions so that everything is right and we don't always get it right. So this is the first ethical consideration from a point of view of the media which one needs to look at. Television remains the biggest um, medium to reach the widest audience possible. And I think even from a corporate, now company, or the other hand, from a corporate perspective, the level of engagement you can get from workers when there is a human story and support in initiatives related to aspects which are going in that direction helps. Now, there is that fine line between charity and corporate social responsibility. And at times, a number of initiatives are driven by the charitable aspect. I believe that when the charity aspect involves the engagement of a professional institution on the other side, which is hands-on and employs professionals to, de to deliver a high-level service, there, in my interpretation, is also a way of doing corporate social responsibility by entrusting, by empowering the experts to deliver the right approach. I mean, there, is, there are these misconceptions at times, like, for example, that retain the, the, the argument of um, Dharma Propaganda, it's being run by volunteers. The reality is that volunteers do elements, which even at times benefit from the CSR um, day, um, which is organized, which is not related to the direct professional service. Dharma Propaganda, for example, employs around 200 professionals, which are specifically engaged in giving professional care. So when you realize, in my opinion, you're doing charity, like even when you support the community chess fund or support all other things, you're engaging with professionals. I think we need to, as a culture, one point, not only the individualistic aspect, which we do have, the silo mentality. And I think the biggest challenge that we have is to overcome these silos, boundaries, and work together. And where one can deliver a level of service by teaming up, we can deliver more. And this is where we will be going next in, in our own initiative, where we have, again, ethical considerations. A few months ago, I came up with this idea to create something to address um, the issue of children, to empower children. And the more I read, the more I study, the more I discuss people, the more we get scared to sure, make sure you're doing the right thing. 
So the beauty of it was that I found all doors open, including um, Ruth, and made documentation, I spoke with you there, and make all documentation available to make sure that there is something which is sound. And I think this is a very good approach in which when you, this is going to be our own CSR initiative, when it is um, built around something which is authentic and you believe in it, I found that even my own team, the set level of engagement of doing that extra, because you know that ultimately there's going to be a delivery. But I think for a country like Malta, the need to overpower silo mentality in anything we do, especially when it comes to CSR, is going to be essential, not just with CSR, but let's take it with CSR. It's crucial so that these ethical considerations can be overcome because we have one thing. We became individualistic, not Malta, as a kind as a human nature more. I think we need to introduce again the common good. And if we reintroduce the common good in what we do, I think CSR will have a defined, more defined um, importance. I have, sorry, given you the wrong information about, uh, about uh, Chris. Yes, so I think Chris should introduce himself. I gave you the wrong information, sorry. It's, that's a hat I wore a couple of years ago. Right. Yeah. Changed a lot of hats. So, 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 so it's not what he's called. Like to uh, today I'm, a, I'm the senior consultant of the parliamentary secretary in matters of sports. And that is, uh, that is my job, basically. I apologize, but now you now so now, now you know what this does. So that's that, okay. That's still interesting though, because the sport angle is equally important. I know that as a foundation, we found great support from the World Football Association when we wanted to make a video about um, well, basically saying no to gender-based violence. And uh, they took up this, this idea of ours and ran with it and, and, and showed it at uh, uh, matches and, and it, it got a, a great deal of mileage. And that was MFA's uh, CSR contribution. But of course there are many more. How, how do you see uh, sport and CSR and that ethical divide coming in? Because it, it is a really fine line, as <coughs> just said. Yes, first of all, I would like to thank the Mass Fan Foundation. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, following following Jess is quite a task, so it's mm -hmm. so bear with me. Um, I'm just a boring lawyer who speaks about boring issues. No such uh, thing. I always <laughs> have to speak together on this panel. There are three of us, so watch it. So, um, yeah, I, I tend to consider myself to be a fun lawyer because I'm a sports lawyer by profession, so there's an element of fun there. Um, no, but going back to, to the subject. Uh, I come from a sector that in itself is part of social responsibility, sport, even if you look at the legislative framework, both nationally and internationally. Sport has always been um, an avenue, uh, something by which other entities can engage in corporate social responsibility by using the medium of sport. Uh, so, along the years that we had the Parliamentary Secretary say about local football academies who uh, take in children who come from uh, families dealing with very difficult issues, free of charge, just to give access to sport and to that well-being, the aspect of health in sport, to, to our kids. But when we talk about ethical implications, we have to be very, very, very careful. I think this morning I had a, and this is a, a secret I'm going to have, I had a nice chat, a nice brainstorming session with Jess on, on where we should go today, as Jess and I come from very similar backgrounds. He has a media on his side, but if he went on sport, he would have, he would have gone on the same, on the same, on the same aspect. And something very important, that is to be kept in mind. Talking about the ethical, uh, the ethical part of CSR is the first basic question. Is corporate social, so, social responsibility ethical in itself? And that's, funny 
enough, when you start, when you answer that question without thinking, you will say, well, yes, of course. But when you actually start thinking about it, there is a big question mark. It's not that straightforward a question to answer. Why? Because, first of all, CSI has to balance, in my opinion, the target that the entity engaging in CSI wants to achieve vis-a-vis -vis the benefit of the community that is going to receive that, that engagement. And secondly, and I will explain why I'm going in this direction, and secondly, when entities are dealing with CSI, there can be an issue that they engage in public uh, projects that should be undertaken by the government and not by private companies and can lead to people uh, losing, not faith in the political system, but that, that is, has been long gone for many years now, uh, but looking at society in a different way than it should. I pay my taxes so that I get back basic public services. In the world of sport that is becoming heavily commercialized, it is probably right now in Europe, if not the first, the second largest business economic activity in Europe. There are millions, hundreds of millions, literally going in and out of the game of football. Is the kind of corporate social responsibility they are engaging in really socially responsible, really ethical? And this is a debate which I believe will not find a clear answer because I read a quote, I read a quote somewhere uh, that said, the best corporate social responsibility you can ever engage in is when you do something and have absolutely no idea that you are engaging in corporate social responsibility. Because when you do that, there are no targets, there are just benefits, and you are not trying to replace anyone or anything. So, we have to be very careful about how sport is going to move in the coming days, months and years. Because even though it is a source for good, and we are seeing that it is a source for good, and it will always be a good source of good, is the target effectively ethical corporate social responsibility? Let's stop with the question. Thank you. I think those thoughts were examples. Great, great case to put to students for a private international, public international law exam. But anyway, let's not go there. Um, regarding, though, the intention behind it, which comes back to your value idea, I think this is a very interesting topic. The foundation, um, I'm a great believer in providence, and I was really at my wit's end as to how to get some cash to finish off a big project, a community-based project with a, a van that we have going. And uh, a donor appeared from nowhere, um, a, a very well-known person, to say that they wanted to give us a donation as long as we didn't credit him anywhere. He didn't want any fame or fortune, and as a matter of fact, we had a private viewing of, of the finished product, and I said, would you like to come to the launch? No, 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 I, I, that, I don't, you know, that's enough for me that I've seen it. Now, I imagine these people are few and far between, although I say I am a firm believer in providence. But in fact, when we come to CSR and this recognition, th this is the ethical line we're talking about, isn't it, Roberta? So uh, an issue that I have come across working with different companies because my experience at least so far working in this area is that you have two extremes. So you have on the one hand those organizations that are very visible with what they do and perhaps one can question to a certain extent what they're doing and why they're doing it. <clears throat> and then you have on the other end of the spectrum other organizations who are doing actions that would be uh, included under the general understanding of what CSR entails. Um, but when it comes to encouraging them to communicate 
their efforts and their achievements, they say, no, we don't like to boast about it. In fact, that's a word that, that I have come across boast. And uh, here is where I think some sort of guidance is needed because a uh, very well implemented CSR strategy in order for it to be able to have a positive impact, impact and bring about change, it needs to engage stakeholders. So the stakeholders are the employees of the organizations, of the organization, they're the business owners, also the clients, they're the neighbors, they're other professionals that we engage with. So without that stakeholder engagement, we cannot have a result. And without communicating our efforts, uh, we cannot engage people. Now, here I think we have to also define how we are communicating with different stakeholders. So one does not necessarily have to have a press release in the newspaper, one does not necessarily have to go on TV and post the their language, but there are other ways through which we can communicate maybe more directly, even by organizing meetings and uh, having consultation sessions, so people are part of the process. So there's different ways of communicating and engaging people. Uh, something that is also related to this point, I think, is uh, what is referred to as greenwashing. So you have businesses or organizations, because the concept of social responsibility does not only apply to business, it applies to public entities, it applies to NGOs as well, and sports organizations. Um, what are they doing and how much of it is uh, genuine and authentic? So a true and authentic CSR initiative has to be something that is ongoing and it has to be something that looks at what the organization is doing internally in the different areas of social responsibility, um, how it is, for instance, avoiding discrimination within the organization. Um, how it is, for example, reducing uh, its negative impact on the environment. So different ways to which we can be socially responsible and then communicating uh, something that is genuine and authentic as opposed to something that is just a one-off, that is perhaps superficial and that is perhaps boasting, to, to again use that term. Um, on a final note, something that I'd like to point out is that, um, at least with the framework that I use, this concept of ethical behavior in the ISO 26000 framework on social responsibility, uh, there are seven principles, and one of them is ethical behavior. And uh, this is something that is abstract, and I think it's also subjective. So uh, I looked up the definition of what ethical behavior entails. And ethical behavior is behavior that is perceived by the, by the majority as being good and as, be, uh, as being something of positive value. So my question is, uh, companies, should they implement values that are perceived by the majority as being something positive or should they move towards ethical leadership? and communicate, communicate what they think is good and contributes to the common good in the long term. <coughs> right. Okay, thank you, Roberta.